Does the Bible offer any justification for divorce? If so, what are the circumstances? If a Christian is divorced, is it okay for them to remarry? Dr. David K. Bernard looks to the scriptures for answers to these important questions. Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. In Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, Dr. Bernard answers your questions about what the Bible teaches and how those teachings apply to everyday life. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Hello, podcast listeners. This is Dr. David K. Bernard. As General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International, I want to invite you to join me September 19 through 22nd in Indianapolis, Indiana for our annual General Conference. General Conference is an opportunity to experience firsthand what God is doing across North America and around the world through the ministry of the United Pentecostal Church International. Last year's General Conference in Orlando, Florida was one of the best in recent memory. We're expecting God to do great things again at this year's General Conference. You can visit upcigc.com and subscribe to email updates to learn more about what's happening at this year's General Conference. I look forward to seeing you later this year in Indianapolis. God bless. Both Jesus and Paul addressed the topic of marriage and divorce, and their words were challenging for their their initial audience, and their words are still challenging to readers and listeners today. In, in fact, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 10, Jesus' disciples responded to his teaching on, on divorce and marriage by saying, if this is the case with a, of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Is divorce from a biblical point of view ever justified? And if so, what would you say the circumstances are for that justification? And if a person is divorced, does the Bible ever sanction remarriage? And if so, what under what circumstances? This is one of the most difficult questions that we face, and especially as a pastor, it's probably the most difficult issue. Uh, so let's try to look at it from a biblical perspective. There are many different opinions. Uh, some believe there should be no divorce. Some believe there can be divorce, but no remarriage. Some believe there can be divorce and remarriage, and then people differ on what the grounds are. Uh, so you you mentioned Matthew 19. Probably we should take a look at what Jesus said there to give us a fuller context. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 3, and to read through verse 11, the New King James. The Pharisees also came to him, that's Jesus, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's a quote from Genesis. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God is joined together Let not men separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality. The King James says fornication. I think the New King James rightly translates the Greek word meaning all forms of sexual immorality that's physically committed, whether it be fornication in the narrow sense of unmarried people or adultery in the sense of married people or homosexual behavior, uh, it, it would be all covered here, uh, or, or child molestation, um, physical sexual immorality. Uh, and So I'll, I'll start the reading again. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries as an, another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born thus from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. So Jesus goes back to God's original plan before sin entered the human race. 
He says, in the beginning, God made male and female, and he intended for man and woman to marry. That's God's plan. So no, divorce is not God's plan. In fact, the book of Malachi says God hates divorce. And one reason is because he wants godly offspring. So if you get a divorce, that affects children and affects the ability to raise children uh, you know, to, to serve the Lord. Now, so divorce is never God's intention from the beginning. However, sometimes divorce may be the lesser of two evils. So Jesus himself indicated this. Uh, now, in the, when he cited Moses, uh, Moses gave regulations for if you divorce your wife. So Moses didn't actually say, go get divorce, but he talked about if you are going to get divorce, you need to follow certain procedure. And it was basically designed to protect, in that case, the wife. So men were just discarding their wives. And so Moses saying, no, you can't do that. If that, if you're going to get a divorce, you have to follow the procedure and the wife has to have some rights. So it was intended to regulate uh, and, and provide help to people who are caught in a situation that God never intended. So even under the new covenant, so again, Two people who are living for God, who are born again, living a holy life, both living for God. In principle, there should never be a reason for them to get a divorce. And we should go back to God's intention. And in fact, this is how Jesus answered. So the Pharisees, there was a debate among the Pharisees of what were the grounds for divorce. So they were assuming divorce is okay, at least in some cases. So can you divorce for any reason? That's what some of the Pharisees said. If you're, if a man doesn't really like his wife, just divorce her. Others saying, no, she has to have committed adultery or committed some serious wrong. That's the only grounds. So they're asking Jesus to choose between the two. Well, he overrode them and said, wait a minute. You're asking, what are my grounds for divorce? That's the wrong question. You ought to be asking, how can I save this marriage? Because in the beginning, that was God's plan. So whenever we talk about this difficult subject, we should always remind ourselves, and it's important, even if we think there is justification for divorce, the main message we should be sending to the church, to our converts, to our children, to our young people, to the newlyweds is not, oh, let's think of all the ways of getting a divorce. Or if it doesn't work out, I can always get a divorce. That's what the world thinks. Hey, I fell in love. Let's get married. But if problems come up, let's get divorced. But in the church, we ought to think, no, marriage is a commitment for life. When problems come up, let's think of how can we save this marriage? How can we improve this marriage? And I would uh, certainly agree. It's not God's will for us to live in a dysfunctional, painful, horrible marriage. But the alternative is not to jump to divorce. The, the alternative is to get help and to reestablish the basis of the marriage. So the question should always be, how can I preserve, salvage the marriage? However, Having said all that, we still live in a sinful world, and sometimes divorce is the lesser of two evils. Jesus indicated this because he said, if you just divorce your wife and then you go marry someone else, you committed adultery. What he's basically saying is, and he uses the case of the man, but obviously it would be true either way it goes. But he's saying, look, if you divorce your wife, you break your vow. You've made a lifelong commitment. You break it. And then you go marry someone else. Well, in fact, you have committed adultery. That's wrong. But he says, except for the cause of fornication or sexual immorality. So what if your spouse has committed sexual immorality? Or we would say adultery. Well, then in a very real sense, they've broken the marriage vow. So then you may... Be a, that they've already broken it. So then if you get a divorce, you're not the cause of the divorce. Now, I would hasten to say, Jesus doesn't say you have to get a divorce, but he just says, except there could be an exception. So my thought would be, and as a pastor, I've worked with many situations over the years. I've seen a husband commit adultery, wife commit adultery, but they're repentant. And there's a high ability to restore if both parties are willing to work on it. If the party you have sinned is truly repentant, willing to accept accountability and guidelines, and if the other person is willing to forgive, then the marriage can be saved and often is saved. And many times 
uh, that should be the, the, the best outcome. But there are other times where the sinning party is persistently sinning. It's not just one act, but continuing or is unrepentant or, uh, you know, there could be other circumstances where the marriage is irretrievably broken. So Jesus did acknowledge uh, if you divorce your wife and marry someone else, you've sinned, except if your wife has committed adultery, then you haven't sinned. So at least that indicates that if your spouse is unfaithful, particularly unrepentant and persistently unfaithful, then you would have grounds for divorce. Now, some would argue it's only grounds to divorce. I think most and the UPCI would acknowledge uh, that there were that if you have a legitimate grounds for divorce in that case, then you would also have a right to remarry. So the UPCI position is that uh, for two saved persons or someone who's saved, the only grounds for divorce would be if their spouse commits uh, the only grounds for divorce and remarriage, I would say, is if the spouse is unfaithful to the marriage vows, committed adultery in whatever way. Uh, now, we do uh, treat the person as of the time they come to the Lord. So in their past life, we don't consider their past divorce. Uh, there, there's nothing they can do about that. And, and I would certainly say this because sometimes the question comes up, well, I've divorced and remarried. And now I realize what I did was wrong. I, I, did, I didn't have that exception. Maybe it was before I came to the Lord or whatever. Here's the way I look at it. Even though it might be wrong to get a divorce, God recognizes the fact that you did get a divorce. You can't undo that. So, for example, in John 4, the woman at the well, uh, Jesus said, you've had five husbands and the one you're living with is not yours. He didn't say you had one husband and then every other marriage since then was adulterous and wrong. Even though it might her multiple marriages might have been wrong, she did it. And he made a distinction between getting married and then just living with someone. So, you know, some argue that a, a marriage can't be dissolved in the sight of God. I don't believe that's the case. I believe a marriage can be dissolved even when it's wrong. So somebody could get a divorce without proper grounds, but they still got a divorce. That's a fact. So then the question becomes, if they're still divorced and they realize I did wrong getting a divorce, well, you could explore if you could get be reconciled with your former spouse. That, that I think part of repentance would be to see if that's even feasible. But if you're the one that did wrong, it may not be feasible, or the ex-spouse may have gone on and is not even willing, may have another partner. But certainly in the case you've divorced and remarried, then you realize, well, I sinned. I was against God's will. Well, what's the situation? Some people say, well, break up. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. Two wrongs don't make a right. Here's how I look at it. When you married the first time, you make, made a lifelong vow. When you married the second time, you made a lifelong vow. You can't keep both of them. It's, a, it's impossible to keep both. So you already broke one. So logic would be keep the one you're in now. You can't fulfill God's will going backward, but you can fulfill God's will going forward. So if you've divorced or remarried against God's will, that is adultery, Jesus said. Once you recognize that, repent. Once you repent, God forgives you. Then it is not continuing adultery to live with your spouse because you've repented. And you can't do anything to undo that. It's like if you kill somebody, you can't bring them back to life. All you can do is repent. So if you've made two lifelong vows, you've broken one beyond repair, it's impossible to fulfill. Well, now you, you're honor bound to keep the one you're in. Otherwise, if we didn't say that, we could say, well, you know, the person could just leave the, the, the second person or he could go be with somebody else and it wouldn't be adultery. But I think we say no, at whatever time you repent and you're determined to follow God's will, then you're accountable from that moment on. Okay, so my, my basic answer is divorce is not God's will. Divorce is allowable in certain cases if the spouse has been physically unfaithful to the marriage vow through adultery. Um, now, while Jesus did talk about lusting after someone being adultery in your heart, that's not the same as physical adultery. So even though lust or pornography or other forms of misconduct may be wrong and need to repent, uh, 
and need to be accountable to your spouse, I don't think that falls under the category here of an automatic grounds for uh, divorce or remarriage. I think that lust would have to be acted out in practice, in, in reality, with, with another person. Now, some people also look at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7. And he's, he's trying to apply Jesus' words, but he's applying it to a new situation that the Lord didn't address, which is what if one spouse is in church and one spouse is not? He says, well, you should still stay married. married. Uh, even though your spouse is not in church, that doesn't invalidate the marriage. However, what if the unbelieving spouse just refuses to live with you? Now that you're a Christian, they don't want that life and they leave you. He says, well, you're not under bondage in such cases. Some people will then say, well, there's a second grounds for uh, divorce and remarriage, and that was abandonment. And then there are cases which are very similar to that, and that is physical abuse of the spouse by by one spouse against the other. Um, that that in essence is violating the marriage vow in a different way. It's it's like an abandonment. Uh, so here's my answer on that. Paul said the the believer is not under bondage. So I don't think you have to chase the person. I think if they get a divorce, okay, uh, it's not your fault. Uh, and the same way, I would say if someone is being subjected, you or your children are being subjected to physical abuse in the home, you don't have to live with that. You can walk out on that. Now, I do believe, uh, and, and I will also say experience as well as statistics and my own a personal pastoral experience shows an abuser is very unlikely to quit without outside accountability. So many times he, the abuser uh, must be turned in to the police, must be given counseling, must be held accountable by an outside party, by a third party. Uh, I don't believe uh, a spouse, and 95% of cases, it's women who are abused. I don't, believe, I don't believe a woman has to live in a case of ongoing abuse. And when I say ongoing abuse, the person may repent and say they're sorry, but unless there's outside intervention and accountability, it's highly unlikely um, that, that that will end. It will continue. So, uh, But the way I look at it from a pastoral sense is that does not... I don't think Paul was trying to expand Jesus' exception. So I would not regard the cases of abandonment or abuse as an automatic right to remarry. I do believe they would be a right to uh, not be bound by the situation. So to go ahead and get a divorce to protect yourself legally, if that's what's necessary. Uh, in the case of abandonment, your, your your life may be hung up, your finances are hung up by somebody you don't even know where they are. And so you might have to get a divorce to protect yourself. And likewise, um, if you're being abused, you may have to get a divorce or at least a separation just to protect yourself or your, your children. And I think that's okay. But I don't think you should jump to remarriage. I think you should look for time to see if that separation or that divorce will wake up the sinning spouse so they will come to repentance and there could be a miracle of restoration and rebuilding and counseling and could restore the marriage. But if not, chances are that sinning spouse is going to move on to another relationship and then there will be adultery and then there would be a clear grounds to, to remarry. So what I'm saying is in the case of adultery, especially when it's unrepentant, persistent, I do believe there are clear grounds for divorce. And subsequently, there could be a remarriage. In the case of abandonment or abuse, I think there are clear grounds for separation and if necessary, divorce. Um, but I think you should wait to see how it's going to play out. And presumably, the Lord's words will come into play uh, which would eventually result in the possibility of a remarriage. And I base that on 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about, uh, you know, he says you, you should stay together, but if you don't, be uh, remain unmarried or be reconciled. So let's say two Christians, for some reason, they, they can't get along and they separate. And it's not really a scriptural reason. Well, there's, they should remain unmarried then or be reconciled. So we do recognize that even when um, the grounds fall short of what scripture describes, sometimes there are issues where people separate or they can't get along, uh, but in that case, remain unmarried or be reconciled. 
And then finally, yes, this can be a hard saying, especially in our secular culture, which maximizes personal happiness and do whatever you want. And if you're not happy, then go do whatever you need to make yourself happy. But that's not the scriptural response. Jesus said, you know, marriage is not the highest goal. Your relationship with God is your highest goal. So some people can't even physically get married because of birth defect. Some people can't get married because of what has happened to them in life. And he was living in a, a time when uh, it was sadly a common practice to take little boys and uh, make eunuchs of them uh, so they could serve in certain capacities. So you might have today transgender people. They might have been surgically affected so they can't fulfill what God intended. And so Jesus says, you know, there are some people that are going to remain single because of birth, some because of circumstances of life, and then it's some for the sake of the kingdom of God. And uh, that's true of all single adults at some point. Um, until you find the right person to marry in God's will, then you remain celibate. And so you remain single by choice, because not because maybe you want that, but because that as a Christian to obey God's will. So let's say your spouse dies. You, you have the potential for remarrying, but you, you may never get remarried or it may be some time, or let's say there's a divorce. So there are cases where we look at it and we say, in order to fulfill scripture or in order to fulfill the will of God for my life, I should be single. And Jesus said, you know what? If you think this teaching is too strict, well, maybe you're supposed to choose the choice of the single life in order to serve the Lord. Uh, and again, that sounds like a hard saying for us, and it's easy to say, but harder for someone else to live. So that's why as a pastor, I try to always be compassionate. But I always look for, is there a way to salvage the marriage? If there's not, well, then is there a good reason why they need to separate? Uh, and if there is, and, and then then divorce. If there is, then ultimately, is there a legitimate ground scripturally for remarriage. And there are, there are cases like that. And in conclusion, uh, for United Pentecostal ministerial credentials, for example, if your divorce occurred before you were baptized in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost, then we don't look at that. If your divorce occurred after you were baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost, then we would want... Uh, uh, two witnesses to verify that your former spouse committed adultery at some point. And therefore, according to the words of Jesus, uh, you're free to divorce and remarry. So that's, that's how we apply these teachings in the context of UPCI ministry. Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share apostolic life in the 21st century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.